All right. We had some technical difficulties, but I believe we are all sorted out now. So yay. All right. So we will get started. Thank you all for joining us this lovely evening. Um, and most especially, thank you to Julia Haynes for joining us. Um, as Bobby just said, it is so great when we have our really successful alums come back and share their knowledge, um, not only with the current students, but also with all of us faculty who <laughs> miss you when you go. Um, so Julia was a student here um, in the PhD program here in informatics um, and one of Gary and Judy Olson's students. Um, and she is now at Google. I cannot tell you what she does because it is really top secret. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's not that I won't tell you. I literally cannot tell you because she can't tell me. So, <laughs> or actually she won't tell me and I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> But she is doing some really strategic foundational research for a new product area. So when um, Google launches something super cool in a year or two, you will know that it was Julia's research that got us there. Um, but what she is going to talk to you guys about today is a lot of the work that she did while she was a graduate student here um, and has continued to some degree. Um, we have gotten a lot of requests from graduate students here, especially in our um, professional HCI program, to think about how do you give a pitch? How do you think about a pitch and I said it just so happens that we have pretty much the world's expert on pitching in startup <laughs> ecosystems uh, in our alumni pool and Julia was kind enough to come and share that knowledge with all of you so she's going to talk about her research looking at sort of the whole startup ecosystem and particularly um, sort of the art of giving a pitch so thank you, Julia. Um, we'll do the usual sort of if you've got a clarifying question, feel free to interrupt her. Otherwise, let's let her get through her talk and we'll talk to her at the end with our questions. Thank you, Julia. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Um, and yes, any any cool thing that comes out from Google like in the next two years, I'll take credit for. <laughs> I'll just go with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I um, I'm here talking today um, about uh, some of the work that I conducted while I was here at um, UCI. Um, I, I've kind of been interested in this space um, between technology innovation and human practices. And so this talk is about pitching and about um, you know, what it is and uh, how it's done. Um, but it's also a little bit beyond that um, because one of the things that surprised me in this research that was over a period of a few years um, was the role of pitching in innovation, in collective innovation. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. So some of it will be practical. How many of you are MHCID students? Just show of hands. OK, cool. And the ones remote. Yes, and all of you out there <laughs> the, the camera is. Um, great. So um, I'm going to give the talk, and I'm going to definitely save time for questions. But as I'm giving this talk, um, if any of you have you know something that you're working on, whether it's your project in the MHCID program or a startup that you've been working on or a startup idea, um, I would love for you to come up here and try a pitch afterwards. Um, so just be thinking about that as I go through. Uh, there's some information about the structure. Um, cool. So. Um, first, a little background um, before I dive straight into pitching and why I think that that is, you know, part of this innovation process. Um, so a little bit on ecosystems and innovation and kind of what, uh, where this research emerged from. Um, so it's interesting. This, I think this quote kind of sums up one of the things that I find fascinating, that knowledge, that innovation is, is essentially changing in a lot of ways. And knowledge is fundamentally changing from being contained within a corporation to being contained within an ecosystem of partners. And that, um, that's definitely been true in looking at the startup ecosystems that have been emerging over the past decade. So over the last 10 years, there are startup ecosystems. You know, there's Silicon Valley. There's, will New York City be the new <coughs> Silicon Valley? 
places in Europe, Asia, you name it, Australia. I'm, I'm essentially covering all the continents. I don't know if Antarctica <laughs> has gotten some headlines <laughs> since then, but I wouldn't doubt it. Um, but these have been sprouting up um, a lot over the last decade. And there's lots of benefits to these ecosystems, right? From being able to share um, tacit knowledge, abundant human capital in these areas, um, the kind of culture of startup work, um, and close proximity to lots of support systems. Um, but one of the things that hasn't really been explored is, you know, how is this collaboration taking place? What does this mean? And part of why this is happening now is due to changing dynamics and essentially changing underlying technologies and structures. So over the last 10, 15 years, um, you know, cloud computing, APIs, SDKs, code sharing bases, um, tools to become a developer, marketing platforms, social networks, all these things have really combined to kind of create this um, technological infrastructure that, have, that has allowed um, these startups to, um, to essentially form in different ecosystems across the world. Um, then there's the soft infrastructure, kind of the know-how of um, becoming a startup. Processes like Lean Startup and um, things like Startup Weekends and Lean Startup Machine. And there are also lots of other structures for seed investment, for mentoring, training, curricula that are out there. So all of these things have kind of been changing. Um, but still, how are ideas flowing within these, these broader ecosystems? Um, there, there hasn't been a lot of empirical work, and this is all relatively new phenomenon. So this research that I'm going to talk about um, was conducted over um, a couple of years for my dissertation work um, with some background research in Silicon Valley. Um, and two main field sites in, at accelerators um, and the broader ecosystems around Singapore and Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, but the, the startup community is very fluid and also fortunately very welcoming to researchers. Um, so I've talked to people from essentially all over the world, all over different um, startup ecosystems. Uh, yeah, and there's some of, some of everything that was included there. Um, and now I want to mention innovation and what I actually mean by innovation. Because a lot of focus and attention is on um, disruptive innovation. And while I think that's what a lot of technology startups today strive for, that's not necessarily the realm of um, of where they're kind of situated uh, within kind of a broader picture of innovation. So before all of this started happening, there was really kind of this, not necessarily linear, but this sort of multi-step process wherein there would be an invention, there would be research and development into creating something um, usable from that, which is technically sort of the innovation phase. Um, and then there would be diffusion of that innovation. And what we've seen happening, and this is, um, this is thing, these are findings that came out of this work um, that I'm also using to kind of frame why pitching is interesting. Um, one of the things that has really changed with this is um, that the process has kind of started to flow a little bit differently. Um, modern day tech startups have a very different process. Um, rather than investing in actually creating something and then going to potential funders to try to scale that and diffuse it, um, the, essentially through lean startup and a variety of other startup practices, um, the flow has kind of changed from this idea of having a tentative idea um, typically called your MVP, minimum viable products, but a minimum viable product need not even be a product. It could be a, a testable idea. Um, and iterating in a loop 
to <coughs> experiment and measure with that and uh, kind of evaluate its potential for diffusion <coughs> and then actually creating and building it. Um, so this is definitely a, a change. And what that means is, you know, thinking about innovation in startups, and this is kind of loosely based on um, Norman and Verganti have done some work on um, innovation <laughs> and uh, kind of loosely actually based on, um, on Stokes' work on Pasteur's quadrant. But over here, uh, can you still hear me if I go over here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but essentially over here you have like product innovation and whether that is more incremental or radical. And then you have diffusion, um, whether that's low or high. And so over in the you know, upper right-hand corner is um, kind of the sweet spot that the startup community is always kind of hailing and focusing on, um, but doesn't often reach. Um, in the upper left corner, you have more vision-driven startup innovation where people, you know, where a, a, a team um, may come up with some sort of really interesting technology, but they have no idea what it could be used for by people. <laughs> Um, and then you have over in the, the bottom right hand corner um, lean startup innovation, which mm -hmm. is what I would say the majority of technology startups um, today are really, that's kind of their realm, um, particularly with the iterative processes and the way that lean is kind of focused. So this is really the area that I'm talking about when I talk about how pitching can help in innovation. I, I don't know that it could really help with some dramatic, radical um, product innovation. All right, so now moving on to pitching. Um, so why pitching? Um, I came into this project looking at how, how is innovation being accomplished? How are startups actually creating innovative products and what is it they're doing to get there. And so I looked at things like lean startup processes and the experiments that they would do and the A-B testing and um, I looked at how they were doing agile development and I, I looked at a number of other things in the curricula of these accelerator programs um, and there are lots of interesting things, there are a lot of dynamic practices, but I also noticed they were pitching all the time. They were <laughs> pitching constantly. Um, and I was really struck by the intensive focus on this and what was it accomplishing. Um, so I started paying attention to it a lot more. Um, and when I say it was happening all the time, the, like, literally from day one, the teams came in and began pitching. And there were even activities to pitch each other's projects. And at first, I was, I was a little surprised by this because they hadn't even gotten to the point of testing some of the ideas out. So why are they pitching? Because the pitch is going to change. Um, so it was kind of curious. And <coughs> so the pitch um, in and of itself can be seen as a pretty mundane practice. Um, you know, if you've ever been to a startup weekend or watched videos from like TechCrunch Disrupt, um, demo days, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of pitching going on. Um, it's typically seen as something that's done to garner investment. Um, and it's typically the <coughs> format of a brief oral presentation that can range anywhere from, you know, two minutes, maybe less than two minutes to, um, you know, six to ten minutes, depending on uh, the format and the audience. Um, but essentially, they follow the same sort of idea of, um, you know, illustrating a product and business idea, a little bit about the team, um, the business model, the market potential, customers, um, and typically requesting funding or something at the end. Um, and. It's interesting because this is, well, pitching has existed in a number of different arenas. Um, pitching for technology startups um, is definitely different now than it was in the 1990s and early 2000s where a business plan was more the norm. Um, 
And that has a lot to do with uh, lean startup methodologies because the whole central theme of lean startup is that you know, no business plan um, survives first contact with a customer. So it's, it's important to have some sort of um, you know, loose structure um, and way of communicating and conveying key points that can be nimble and flexible along with the product. Um, but that's the typical pitch and typical format of the pitch. And so now I'm just going to show a quick example from um, a pitch from Y Combinator. Um, so I'll exit out of this. It's over here. Um, and so this actually isn't a demo day pitch. It's um, This isn't a demo day pitch. This was a pitch um, prior to demo day in front of um, other investors and partners and mentors to gather feedback for improving the pitch for demo day. So I will go ahead and play. That doesn't appear to be working. All right. Worked a minute ago. We'll just reload. Hi, we're Magic Bus, and we are the best way to commute between cities and suburbs. If you need to take a ride between San Francisco and San Mateo during rush hour, you basically have a couple options right now. If you're rich, you can take an Uber, and it's fast, but it's expensive. If you're not, you can take Caltrain, and it's cheap, but takes a really long time. Magic Bus is the best of both worlds. We're as cheap as Caltrain, and we're way faster almost as fast as driving directly. This is possible because with Magic Bus, you book ahead of time. It's actually a better experience for commuting because you know what time to wake up and what time to get to your office. And it allows us to fit 14 people on a vehicle while making very few stops. Our routes are very efficient. Getting people around town is a $500 billion market. It's what Uber is dominating. We're attacking a market that is twice as big, and we have the best solution in the world for it. We make 50% margins because we're so efficient and because we fit so many people per vehicle. So we're much less like a traditional bus company and much more like a software company. Not only that, but we have zero CapEx because we don't own any of our vehicles. We've created a marketplace of large vehicles that serve our customers. Our product is extremely sticky. 50% of our riders use Magic Bus every single day, and our average rider generates $3,000 of revenue per year. We're growing extremely fast, 40% monthly. And we're gonna keep growing really fast because every dot on this map represents a person who's signed up to use Magic Bus. Right now, we're serving portions of the peninsula, but all we need to do to access 10,000 more people is activate new areas, and we have thousands more people in other cities. And by the way, this is not just a San Francisco phenomenon. This works anywhere that you have a dense urban core surrounded by suburbs. So we're Magic Bus, and if you want to ride home this evening, come talk to us. Thank you. Two fourteen. That's the time. You went fourteen seconds over. First of all, uh, I thought your your presentation style was actually quite good, except you se you seemed a little unhappy. <laughs> so um, you know, smile. You have a nice smile, so you should smile. You know, if you don't smile, you either seem unhappy or angry. Neither one of which is something that's really amenable to investment. Um, so. Uh, I also, like, I, I'm a little lost about, like, you have this marketplace of buses, and, like, I get Uber because, like, I think there's a lot of people, like, UberX at least, I get that, they have cars, and Uber, there are a lot of people with black cars. 
are there a lot of people with buses? And is that the marketplace? I, 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 like, there's no picture of a bus there, so I can't really imagine what you're talking about. So it sounds all kind of good, but I, you kind of lost me on that point. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, for context, it's charter companies who do wine tours and stuff like that on weekends. They have like no business during weekdays, and so that's where we see this that's opportunity. A, a hole you should fill in the presentation. Also, on your graph, I, I don't think you said what the y-axis was, did you? Oh, okay, yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I can get into the t to top line metrics. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So there's a, actually a lot going on there. It maybe on the face of it just seems like somebody just kind of talking through what their idea is. But there is a very particular structure. There's very particular vocabulary. You probably heard things like sticky, funnel, capex. Um, and there's a very particular structure that is kind of adhered to kind of across the board um, for, it, for all sorts of different audiences, um, which I'll go through in a second. The other thing is this is, this is what I witnessed like every week, like multiple times a week, was somebody giving a pitch like this and not only getting feedback from one person, but from pretty much everybody else in the room and even activities where you would have to do a pitch for someone else so that it would raise questions that you have that you know maybe this doesn't make sense to you. Um, but so the structure that he just used is a very common structure um, that is used in other accelerators and all sorts of other um, other kind of mentorship programs for startups. So there's an opening. Um, this one not necessarily as um, strong and emotional, but very relatable in terms of a problem that people can identify with. Um, you you want people to understand the problem as the second part and the solution. Those are all very sort of clear things. Then you move into traction, which is this idea that, oh, this actually has some meat, this seems like something people could use, are people you know, already starting to use it? Um, the potential market, I think, I think they said their potential market was twice as large as Uber's, <laughs> which is also something that you see a lot of um, kind of in, in compressing something into two minutes, being able to relate that to another well-known technology um, uh, startup or service. Um, is is seen as very helpful, and the market you know that's that's indicated is always massive. Um, the business model: how are they actually going to make money from this? Which is kind of where the appeal starts to to come in for investors. Um, then the team, why are they the appropriate team to be able to do this? Um, what, what's their expertise? Um, what their vision is long term? So for this company, it's, it's ultimately to get more cars off the road and improve traffic situations um, and help the environment. Um, then the ask is you know kind of giving them reasons to engage and then a closing where you kind of summarize the things that you want people to remember. So that's kind of the general structure. Um, it's a very familiar format worldwide. This same thing happens in Singapore, it happens in Buenos Aires, <coughs> um, and it's, it's a very similar structure. Um, although I'm showing this one uh, because Y Combinator does all of theirs in two minutes because they have so many teams. <laughs> um, so what was fascinating about this to me was not this structure and kind of the what you would expect as this you know rhetorical structure and communication to potential investors um, but that over a period of time um, it seemed to me from witnessing these teams over periods of several months that pitching wasn't adapting to where they were taking their product. Pitching was in fact shaping their product and shaping strategies and shaping their business because of this sort of interactive format and the fact that this would be done so frequently not just with other startup co-founders um, 
and other people involved in the accelerator, but also um, mentors, investors, potential customers. Um, and I will say also every accelerator pro or most accelerator programs also bring in actors um, <laughs> to, to help with, uh, with the presentation of all of this. So part of it is also that, but um, in fact, it, it became clear over this extended period of time that this was playing a larger role. Um, so, so I began thinking about this a lot um, throughout the course of many, many months. And um, I'm going to walk you through a couple of the ways, a couple of the theoretical frameworks that kind of influence the way that I was <coughs> thinking about pitching and its, its role. And one of those is boundary objects. So, you know, this notion of boundary objects, you know, per Star and Griesmer is, you know, it's, it's been used and misused in a variety of ways. Um, but what I really like about it is that it describes something plastic enough to adapt to constraints, but robust enough to, um, to have you know, multiple different um, translations between different groups of people. And um, it's, it has a common identity. Um, so pitching, so for instance, pitching is a boundary object between startups and investors, that's clear. Um, but it's also one between mentors, um, peers, and lots and lots of other people, the industries that they're working in, um, the media, customers, and other potential partners. Um, and so this, this seemed to be the way in which, and I should also point out that a lot of these startups have kind of a, a lack of other education in terms of other ways that they could kind of share their ideas and um, you know test them out with different people. So, um, so this ended up being a very common way to do that. So one example of um, one of the teams that I followed um, that this, this was really evident with was uh, this Team Healant, which was a super highly qualified and experienced team. Um, they wanted to use smartphone sensors and machine learning to help make healthcare predictive, what they kept calling Healthcare 2.0. Um, and they were developing prototypes, but that was incredibly time consuming. So instead of developing prototypes and like saying like, oh, this is what we're working on, they relied on pitching um, to explore what areas might be of interest between all of these different um, stakeholders. And they translated those ideas in two different stakeholders through pitching. And then given feedback from alumni um, teams throughout the course of the project, um, or throughout the course of the accelerator, um, they began exploring uh, sort of working with this physician model where instead of end users monitoring seizures or other things, that it would actually be something physicians could prescribe and uh, to monitor individual patients. Um, so it was best suited for uh, preventative care um, for maybe some sort of chronic conditions. And this focus um, was refined iteratively by pitching um, before deciding the ultimate uh, product development direction. So this was sort of how they actually got to um, the place that, and this team actually still exists, which they've, they've broken past the two-year barrier um, and they're still working on their ideas. So um, also thinking about this in terms of being um, a site of imagination. So envisioning, um, a, <clears throat> envisioning as a tool for imagination and design. Um, so this relates back to sort of the notion of, um, you know, projected geometry and perspectives. So back at the origins of architecture, you know, this enabled stone cutters and architects to imagine buildings that were yet unbuilt before attempting to construct something. Um, so in the same way, we can kind of think of pitching as a site of imagination. 
um, to imagine an unbuilt product and iterate and refine on it. Similar to thinking of things that are well known in the design community but are not as well known within startup communities around sketching and using other materials um, to, uh, to help design their products. So Obatech, another team that I followed, is an is a example of this. Um, they came in uh, to um, the JFDI Accelerator Program with the goal of trying to eradicate fake drugs in Indonesia. They wanted to create a mobile-based platform connecting good pharma, good, good pharma, good pharma, pharmaceuticals, and consumers. <laughs> Um, but they consistently throughout um, the pitching process over several months receive feedback on how and whether the solution would work in reality and whether the problem actually really existed in the same uh, way that they thought it did. And again, developing a prototype, because this isn't just a product, it's also a, a business that they would have to scale, developing a proto prototype and rollout would require significant advance investment a priori. Um, so they began to use the pitch as sort of the site of imagination um, with stakeholders and with potential customers. And they continued to iterate and refine and adjust um, to adapt to these new challenges um, that people were suggesting to them. And they ultimately developed a product that was patient facing front end and a back, back end for doctors to monitor and data analytics to help pharmaceutical manufacturers. So it was it became a, a much more, much more multi-layered um, project, <laughs> um, product by having all of these different stakeholders um, engage and, and iterating on their pitch helped them get there. I also want to briefly touch on, um, on the ideas of identity and agency. So there's the whole focus on innovation, which is primarily what I've been talking about. But um, there's also this notion that you're building this team from scratch and kind of solidifying your identity as a startup and having a sense of agency about what you're going to do um, is actually really important to these teams and something a lot of them struggled with. Um, so this sort of framework of figured worlds um, is, is this idea that um, worlds are formed through social interaction. And in those interactions, people figure out who they are in relation to those who are around them. And so, you know, there's a couple different ways of thinking about that. There's, a, you know, very conceptual, this internal sort of sense making process of who you want to be. And then there's kind of the practice or performance of that identity that's a little bit more um, procedural. So thinking about this in relation to the pitch, the pitch kind of seemed um, to be this catalyst for reflection and identity shaping, as well as clearly um, a very performative practice that could provide confidence and a sense of agency for the startups. Um, so just a couple quick examples of this. Um, Skimble, the, the team on the left over there, um, were a team that actually struggled a lot. They were, um, they were working on a tool for sentiment analysis um, for <coughs> retailers um, and those in the food and beverage industry to understand consumer sentiments. Um, more broadly uh, across lots of different uh, review sites and ways that they could garner feedback. Um, but, you know, one piece of feedback that they continually got was, um, was that the, the market size wasn't big enough for that. And they struggled and floundered. And in the last month, I think, of the accelerator program, they changed their pitch to like five different things. <laughs> like, let's just do something completely different um, with retail. And uh, so they, they really did, um, they struggled, but they, they reworked their pitch uh, over and over again and ultimately circled back to their initial idea. Um, but they focused on, in on their pitch, highlighting some of their achievements, which had the effect of refocusing um, on their sort of identity and what they wanted to do to begin with. So I think 
that's also another thing that's happening in this process that I haven't, you know, been diving into, but you know, how, how much are you moving away from what it is you think your identity is as a startup? And so to me, that was kind of an exercise in figured worlding where they were kind of taking this as a reflective process to understand their identity and tracing mm -hmm. their path to where they wanted to be as a startup. And then Molami on the, uh, the right side, they actually came in, they were already getting 800 new users a day. They had millions of users, but they didn't actually know why. They had this viral product that just kind of took off. This is, so this was several years ago, but they, it was kind of stickers, but this is pre-Snapchat days. So putting stickers on photos and sharing them with friends. And they weren't, uh, they weren't quite sure um, you know, whether they were doing the right thing, whether they were pitching things the right way. And they really wanted to appear confident, um, even though they weren't entirely sure why they were being successful. And so they, experience, they experimented with a number of different ways to kind of convey that, um, that confidence in their business. And so they kind of reframed it from being this whole thing about brand engagement to being much more about play and something that they could identify with themselves. And it really did help their confidence. And I wish I had like a video of, that's Arthur, their CEO, from the first day through the, the very last day. It was a dramatic sort of change in the sense of confidence that they had around their product and what they were doing. But as kind of an improvisational um, process, the performance of the pitch really helped um, reinforce you know, the identity and sort of the sense of agency of these teams. And so it was also a great kind of social process that really helped with team building. <coughs> um, let's just do a quick time check, oh yes. Um, so as a, as a design tool, um, so thinking about pitching's role in innovation, you know, we often see or think of pitching as a reflection of things, the product direction that people already are planning to take. Like this is what the startup is doing and the pitch is a reflection of that. But in looking at the process more deeply, you can see that pitching was also influential in the development of the product and the development of the business model and played a dynamic role in innovation of the product and business model. And I think what's interesting is this happens because of the openness of the format and the openness of startup ecosystems and um, working with other stakeholders. The, these are, the pitching sessions are critical and generative. There's lots of critique and feedback and it fosters um, collaboration on an open basis between multiple parties. Um, so this is something that I, I don't think really necessarily existed before um, and has been really interesting. There's a great animation to, to illustrate <laughs> that, uh, which I think is really interesting. But going back to like, why does this all matter and what's interesting about this? So going back to <clears throat> what John Seely Brown said, he suggested that knowledge, we were transforming to kind of knowledge con being contained within organizations to one in which it's contained within ecosystems. And so this has been a really interesting thing to kind of dive into and learn a little bit about um, emergent forms of collaboration between different parties in those ecosystems. And pitching is just one way that happened, but it was really fascinating because that didn't <coughs> seem to be what the role of pitching was um, at first. And it's really important because this also fundamentally impacts and shapes the products, which I think then opens up a whole nother can of worms about, you know, who are involved in those conversations and how can we make sure that the types of products that they come up with are more equitable and, um, and good products because innovation is not necessarily um, a good thing always. <laughs> um, so kind of in conclusion, um, pitching uh, you know, served as a boundary object and a site of um, imagination and open collaboration for these teams. 
Uh, it played a role in shaping innovation rather than just being a mere reflection of it. And it's indicative of these changing organizational forms and kind of the role of ecosystems in innovation today. Thanks. Thanks to all of these. And I'll open it up to Q&A. And also, if anybody wanted to try giving a pitch and getting some of that open collaboration feedback. Oh, I actually know there are some people in this audience who have pitches they could give, but we'll see if any of them will step up. Uh, so, yeah, we do have some time for questions if folks have them. Of course. Yes. <laughs> Advisor get to the pitch. <laughs> so what happens to intellectual property? Who owns the ideas? That's, that's a really... Um, interesting aspect of uh, at least this stage of um, early, so early stage or seed investment level startups, um, IP is essentially kind of not non-existent or not acknowledged. Um, the, the mentality of the community is that ideas are not, um, are not the most valuable thing. It's about how you actually accomplish it. And so until you have actual products and you typically are beyond kind of a Series A first major round of funding, um, I don't think any sort of patents or IP is typically discussed. <coughs> yes, <laughs> that's my committee asking oh, those questions. It's much. not for defense. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm really interested in this. Um, how much did people learn from watching other people pitch? It would struck me that the audience is a big part of this whole process, and that I watch someone do a pitch and then I say, oh, I, I should revise how I do it. So did you look at that very much? Yeah, I think that that, that plays a huge role. Um, I think, I mean, I don't have any examples off the top of my head of somebody seeing another pitch and kind of reflecting on that and how that might impact what they're doing. But it's certainly, you know, an area where there's a lot of knowledge sharing and kind of going back to the IP thing, if somebody else has a good idea that you want to explore, it's, <coughs> it's absolutely something that, and actually I do have a story about that. There, um, uh, beyond the period of time where I was following um, this particular accelerator in Singapore, um, there were definitely some ideas that were being taken from other teams and being pursued. And so there was some competition there. Um, and some teams kind of pivoted to be um, much more competitive with other teams. I think one of the ways that the accelerators that I looked at at least tried to um, mitigate issues with that was to have startups from different sectors and domains so that they weren't directly like one medical oriented startup or at least this portion of medical one focused on like media or entertainment that sort of thing yes yeah, to piggyback on what judy was saying do people worry about uh, someone else is going to steal their idea especially if i'm a startup with three people and maybe google and find <laughs> i have a brilliant idea <laughs> implement it much faster than i do and uh, what's uh yeah no that's actually a really good question and there are some cultural issues related to that um i think uh, because this sort of model is very much um fits in line with the cultural attitude of silicon valley <coughs> startups and that ip doesn't matter um, you kind of have to prove that you can do it and get to a certain level and you have products and then you know you can pursue patents um, I, that's kind of the pervasive attitude within, like, uh, the folks who run accelerators and the, and the sort of startup ecosystems that I witnessed. However, there are different cultural attitudes towards IP, and I know from, um, some folks that I know who have gone and done um, workshops or training sessions working with like Lean Startup Machine and other sorts of programs that there is an unwillingness in some areas and that's been particularly salient in China um, that uh, folks do not want to share their ideas um, 
because they they feel a sense of competition in in doing that but that's not something I I have you know deeply delved into but I definitely I know that that's uh, that's an issue for some folks but I think the um, the idea, the notion that's being spread by the people who are running these types of programs, and particularly by the investors um, who typically have some sort of connection to Silicon Valley, um, it's very much that they they tell you that that doesn't matter and you have to get to a certain level before it does. So. I was just curious to see whether uh, there is any cases where Yes, this person pitched the days, and there's another big company or someone else who has more power or can implement this idea faster, actually steal days mm -hmm. from them. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I mean, I, none of the teams that I studied or followed, I'm sure that that happens, you know, to some extent. But the fact of the matter is that you, the idea is one part of it, and you could steal that. I, you know, I think <laughs> if you went in and took like actual code or actual, you know, some sort of like deeper product plan, um, it would be different and I don't know about anything like that. But in terms of pitching, it's very surface level. So I mean, you could take an idea, but you know, being able, like the, the team that we, you know, we saw <coughs> pitch for Y Combinator, they have, a, they've developed a whole software system underlying, you know, being able to, to track and configure routes. Um, so you can take their idea, but you would, you would also have to kind of build up the product in the same way, so. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Whoever. <laughs> oh, I just have a quick yes. question. Uh, so you, you mentioned that one of the startups got past the two-year barrier. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that recognized in startup ecosystems as the mark that the startup is now like, going to be a successful enterprise? And, mm, so it depends on what you mean by success. Um, <coughs> the two-year mark is typically what's referenced in terms of like if you've survived <coughs> past two years. That's Something like, and I'm sure there's all sorts of different statistics about this, but the vast majority of startups don't make it past two years. Um, what I would say is that's not necessarily a measure of success or failure, because there are also startups that don't engage in this whole world of investment that bootstrap, that are funding, you know, their own. They're they're actually garnering revenues, and um, you know that might be a slower climb towards growth for them. Um, but it might also be more sustainable. Um, so yeah, the, I think that's a tricky thing about the startup world in general is what is success. And typically that has been valuation based on previous investment, which then inflates everything, um, the perception of the value of everything. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I just have a quick question. So mm -hmm. you, uh, you said that the pitch can be used as a open collaboration where everyone will help you shape your product. And in your opinion, where will be the most ideal place for delivering your first pitch? Oh, wow. Um, there's a lot of different places. Um, Startup Weekend is one that's very common. Um, and there's a lot of other kind of smaller um, I think Startup Grind is a fairly global um, organization that hosts pitch nights and mm -hmm. kind of serves as like um, a, a lightweight sort of group and structure for um, <coughs> startups in any particular community. So there are lots of events like that where you'll actually get kind of a diversity of opinions. Um, is, does that answer your question or uh, <laughs> today? I, I mostly is asking about your like personal opinion. Like, what would be your, your most ideal places? Like, oh, yeah, that's hard. I mean, I think you could start anywhere. Um, if you're focused on a particular domain, I, I would say, like, going to people in that domain expertise, you know, very early on is probably really beneficial. We can chat more if you have, like, a specific, um, you know, idea or something and... I'm happy to share links to like communities and stuff. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that was a fascinating presentation, so thank you for that. 
Uh, many of the examples you had seem to be like app-based or software information intensive, and uh, sometimes there are things that really are about physical devices or uh, if I'm creating a new drug or a new kind of massively parallel semiconductor process, uh, they have a much higher threshold uh, for entry. So is the pitch on any of those the same or different? Or um, That's where I would say, going back to um, this sort of area, that those, um, those sorts of uh, much more front-end, labor-intensive, R&D-intensive type of startups wouldn't lend themselves to being in kind of the lean startup space. Um, and honestly, I don't, I, I don't know how much pitching is uh, as important in those because clearly you need uh, you know, more focus on the actual development of prototypes or of things that can be tested. Um, the, the sort of pitching model, I think, lends itself much more to kind of the incremental process of um, <coughs> lean startup, which is predominantly software app, very easily kind of manipulated. So um, kind of picking back off his question, uh, if you define success as an IPO, lifestyle company, or just an exit, um, in your research, did you come across perhaps how many times the founder would fail as in not have one of those and have to abandon the company um, before succeeding in a startup? How often? How, it, did you find any metrics on or any data that looked consistent on how many times an individual or a founder would fail in a company? <laughs> How many failures the founder win? <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, that's really hard to track. I mean, well, this is also, uh, this is an arena in which failure is actually considered a net positive in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of literature and a, a lot of opinions so out there about that. So you them, you failed four or five times ahead of time? goes really well? Um, I think... Uh, so early on, failures are probably just more considered pivots or you, I think to call something a failure, it needs to be a little bit more developed, like you actually had a somewhat significant amount of investment and then, mm -hmm. then that failed. And that relates a lot to like the different funding models, like convertible notes. So not to get into the whole finance aspect of this, but, um, but uh, if there have been innovations in the financing of these startups that have um, enabled safer investment. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, you know, failure and not, you know, investors not losing um, that money. Um, but that said, I, I don't know that there are any particular metrics around failure, but I do know that a lot, oftentimes people will reference other things that they, other, that they have indeed gotten to that, you know, line where they have had investment and then failed and then they can delineate the things that they learned from that and that that makes them a better entrepreneur. Um, but I don't know of any metrics on that, so. Okay. So, um, you talking about the pivot thing, it's just made me think a couple things. One is, I love when you talked about the vocabulary of startups, and I feel like we should have a glossary of what these things actually mean. Like you see these funny cartoons, like a British person says this, what they actually mean is this, or whatever. I feel like it's the same thing in startup world, right? Because I hear people say pivot all the time, and they totally mean, you have completely failed, you need to change your business model and do this other thing. But it's this nice way of saying it, and I wonder if there are other things like that um, that just would be helpful, right? Because some of these guys are hearing these words, and so how do we interpret this kind of language and really understand it in an applicable, practical kind of way? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question, and that's um, something I think that accelerators and a lot of these like organizations um, try to help groom and, and get this vocabulary to be utilized because it is very much, you know, that's, that's the way to communicate to investors. Um, interestingly, Pivot, I have had a lot of like 
debates with other people about how that term gets used because technically pivot, if you were to follow from the actual definition of pivoting and how, uh, you know, the, the, the great minds that be like Eric Ries of Lean Startup, it's apparently not meant to be, a, you know, a failure and a completely new idea. It's meant to retain the vision but change the approach. Mm -hmm. But then everybody just calls anything that they switch early on a pivot. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a lot of very particular terminology. And, um, and I'm sure there are glossaries out there on different startup you know, communities. But um, it is a very particular vocabulary. And it's really interesting because globally, it's the same vocabulary. Um, everybody uses, you know. Final and sticky and pivot. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you think? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. Having just uh, participated in an on-campus business competition, <coughs> it was really interesting. Interesting to me how you said that you're pitching all the time, and you're getting all this information. And we kind of found that in some cases, it's really hard to digest all the information. You have these really seasoned investors telling you competing ideas mm -hmm. and competing things that don't make sense to what you think the business model should look like. I was just wondering if anything in your in your study was able to, you know, measure or account for, you know, that type of information or the analysis paralysis that could maybe come from it. Uh, you just used one of the terms, analysis paralysis. I <laughs> feel like that's a very particular one. That's, that's a real term. Um, yeah, and actually that again goes um, so I think one of the things that, so I predominantly did this research within accelerators. And so there are managers and advisors there to help the teams kind of navigate who to listen to and who not to, which is yet another person to listen to, right? But they're the ones that initially invested in you that you're learning everything from. So uh, they're trying to be teachers about it. But um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. I think that there's some, um, uh, again, going back to you know some uh, cultural differences around that, and um, particularly like occupational cultures, because a lot of people have left. You know, maybe they worked in government before, and now they're doing this startup, and so like you go from like this very hierarchical structure where you just kind of, if somebody higher up says this, you need to do it this way, you you do it that way. Um, versus coming from, you know, maybe some other different sorts of backgrounds. And there were definitely teams that struggled with, like, they would have one, you know, mentor, potential partner come in and tell them one thing, and then two days later they'd have somebody say the exact opposite, and they would really struggle with that. And so, yeah, ultimately that, that comes down to, you know, what the team wants to do. But I think a lot of teams did struggle with that based on kind of like what they were used to um, in terms of taking advice from from people they see as higher up in a hierarchy or something. So, yeah, yeah, oh well. Actually, Catherine first, and then I'll come back. Um, so I actually really liked uh, the way you're talking about um, pitching as like a way to shape and build their product. And so like the formal, uh, purpose for like pitching like and I was hearing like oh it's well to, to evangelize the investors so I was wondering like how formalized um, like among advisors accelerators and like in the culture more broadly is pitching as a means to engage with stakeholders and shape their product um, like is it like accidental or is it actually like, a really deliberate kind of process I don't think it was deliberate at all um, I think I mean if I were to just uh, you know make a guess as to why I think that it kind of took on this role um, <laughs> is that so in these accelerators in these programs there's there's like not really um, much discussion and this you know this is changing but there's not much discussion of like other sorts of things um, <clears throat> from like the realm of design or or how there are processes for actually you know kind of um, engaging at early stages, doing, you know, Wizard of Oz. I, I mean, that's incorporated some, uh, to some extent, but a lot of the actual, um, the people that, 
uh, these teams engage with and a lot of the, the focus of um, the educational or curriculum uh, components is focused on business. And so I think because of that and because of the investment models, the pitch gets so much attention. But I, I do, I mean, in my opinion, a lot of it has to do with other, like a lack of other knowledge or resources to kind of figure out how to continue developing their product. And that it, I would at least say that I don't think it was an, an intentional move to direct uh, the shape of the product or the business on the part of the accelerators. So maybe one more question? Did I see one more here? Yeah. How far along or down the ecosystem have you been personally as far as refining your own pitches? Refining my own pitches? I haven't. <laughs> so it's, it's just like an outsider perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, I participated. So I would say I have not, I have, I've not pitched a startup. <laughs> I've participated in pitching sessions wherein they just asked me to just pitch something. So I pitched, you know, maybe like a research project or something that I would be familiar with because pi me pitching a startup would be really comical. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was an active participant in these accelerators. I would go to their various sessions with investors and potential partners and mentors. And I would participate in the pitching sessions where we, when we took turns, like, and you got somebody else's startup that you had to pitch, I did that as well. <laughs> Um, so I have experience in doing that, but I have never been a co-founder of a startup, so. Cool. <coughs> All right, so I will um, end that with a small pitch for tomorrow. Um, so for those of you who want to talk with Julia more, I'm gonna ask that you not mob her right now because she's got a dinner appointment that she needs to make. Um, but she will be speaking on a different topic tomorrow <laughs> at Gary and Judy's uh, retirement celebration. And we'll be around for ingenuity for those of you who might be thinking about um, coming to that. So you can stalk her readily at the Beckman <laughs> Center tomorrow. Um, but we're going to let her go tonight um, so she can meet her other obligations. So thank you so much, yes. Julia. Thank you.